you it. There's nobody here. No one's watching. <laughs> well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. We're here tonight with Michelle Harper, author of The Beauty in Breaking, along with Carrie Egan. And uh, before we get started, I just have two quick housekeeping notes to tell everyone. The first is, um, and the second portion of our event is dedicated to question and answer. And we really encourage everyone to ask Michelle a question. The way you can do that is to scroll to the bottom of your screen and there's a little question and uh, answer area there. If you click on that, you can ask your question and we will try to get to as many of those as possible. So again, if you click on the Q&A icon, you can ask your question and we're gonna try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, secondly, we really encourage everyone to purchase tonight's book and I have just put a link in the chat and you can purchase that at politicsandprose.com. That's a great way to support our author and also a great way to support the bookstore. And it's a really nice cover too. So. <laughs> um, and with that out of the way, it is my honor to introduce Michelle Harper. She has worked as an emergency room physician for more than a decade at various institutions, including as chief resident at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx and in the emergency department at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Philadelphia. She's a graduate of Harvard and the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University. The Beauty in Breaking is her first book, and it is the poignant story, true story, of her journey towards self-healing. Each of the patients she writes about in the book have taught her something about recuperation and recovery, and in this hopeful, moving, and beautiful book, she passes along the precious, necessary lessons that she has learned as a daughter, a woman, and a physician. Joining Michelle tonight, we are lucky to have Carrie Egan, who is a hospice chaplain, a graduate, graduate of Harvard Divinity School, and author of On Living and Fumbling. Her hospice work has been featured on PBS and CNN, and her essays have appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post, among many other publications. So without any further ado, Michelle and Carrie, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, this is such an honor. I loved your book. I got to read it a long time ago. Um, and I was just completely enthralled, like almost right away, almost right away like within like 10 words. Um, so thank you. Thank you for writing it. And thank you for putting it out into the world. And um, we were talking earlier and I said, you know, sometimes it's strange when like people do those introductions for you because you feel like it's, it sounds so formal. And I thought maybe there was a, a little piece in the beginning of the book where you introduce yourself. Um, and I was wondering if you could read that to us. Yes. We do have a passage here and I will read it. And, and Thank you, thank you for joining me in conversation and reviewing oh. the book early and so gracious of you. Thank you very much. Oh, no, this is my pleasure, honestly. So the passage. I am the doctor whose palms bolster the head of the 20 year old man with a gunshot wound to his brain. I support the baby as she takes her first breath outside her mother's womb. I hug the wife whose husband is dying from advanced liver disease as she implores the universe to take away his pain. I claim no special powers, nor do I know how to handle death any better than you. What I know is that for 36 hours a week, I reside in the melee that is a hospital emergency room where I'm called upon to be salve, antidote, and sometimes charin. Most of the time, my job is to keep death at bay. When I am successful, I send the patient back out into the world. When I'm not, I am there as life passes away. I'm not so deluded as to think that I alone am capable of making that kind of difference. I'm well aware that de the determination of who lives and who dies doesn't happen at my hands alone. There are times when, despite the designs of any patient, family member, friend, or doctor, death will come. Then I am witness. What I can do is be the fairy woman who holds the body as the last breath escapes, the one who, like the night sentinel, calls out the hour and does her best to convey that all is well. Like everyone, I am in this world for only a brief time. And as for many, blessings abound in my life. And they abound amid the struggle, amid my struggle. Over the decades, I've learned to cultivate a personal state of stillness. As a child, that stillness grew from a dissociation I stumbled upon that allowed me to better endure life with a father who was a batterer and with a family legacy of victimhood. As a black woman, I navigate an American landscape that claims to be post-racial when every waking moment reveals the contrary. An American landscape that requires all women to pound tenaciously against the proverbial glass ceiling 
which we've since discovered is made of palladium, the kind of glass that would sooner bow than shatter. It's just a part of the intro. One of the things that fascinated me when you talk about what it's like to work in an emergency room is that coming out of medical school, right, as a doctor, mm -hmm. you have all these choices, right? You have all these choices of what you want to specialize in. Why did you choose emergency medicine? And honestly, I feel I was groomed for the position of an ER doctor because growing up in um, an abusive household, when you don't know what's gonna happen at any time, but you know you have to do your best to be safe, to protect yourself and those around you. So all you have is a snapshot of what's happening at any point in time. And you say, okay, is this likely to blow over? Or is, do I have to act? Do we have to act immediately to save a life? And that's what we have to do in the emergency department. So I, I know that that was part of I mean, it wasn't the intention, but I know that I was groomed for that. Um, and then one of the turning points in my life was uh, being exposed to the emergency department. Um, I share a story, a story about when my brother was trying to protect my mother and during the struggle, and honestly, this could have been one of many days, uh, tragically and unfortunately, where there was violence in a fight. And my brother, in an effort to protect her, was restraining my father. And my father bit his hand. And in that moment, it always stayed with me because the act of doing that, the act of biting another human being, with the intention to harm them, to maim them, to hurt them. And then the fact that that's your family member, I mean, the act itself felt so savage and reminded me that there was no safety in that house and anything was possible. And then I saw an emergency room when I was still young, where all manner of life converges there, all looking for some kind of hope whether you know, it's a child who has a cut being brought in by a parent or someone with brought in by an ambulance, not breathing, where they're intubated, they're doing chest compressions, but all kinds of people, a homeless person who just wanted a break from the elements, everyone there looking for some kind of salvation, even if it was just temporary. And it was a window to me that, although I didn't know a different way of living because I was a child, that there was another way that's possible. And there was some kind of recuperation, recovery, healing that was possible. So that was something else that, yes, I was, I was groomed for being an ER doctor, but being in that environment showed me that there was also hope and that as long as I survived and got better and healed myself, I could then help others to do the same. I worked as a hospital chaplain for not very long, like a hot second, because I like hospice better. This is back when we had beepers, right? And so when the beeper would go off, so this, this is how long ago this was, when the beeper would go off and I would see it was the emergency department, I was always like, oh, man, <laughs> right? Because what you're talking about, like feeling like home for me was hard, right? It's hard, it's hard. And I, the chaplain doesn't work in the emergency room all the time, right? You have to get called there. So to walk into the emergency room and to not know what you're walking into and knowing it's gonna be bad, right? It's gonna be bad, it's gonna be bad. Um, and to walk in and there's, and for people who haven't spent much time in an ER, um, it's, hard, it's hard to even imagine what the energy is like there, right? I mean, some nights it's dead, but like most of the time, like it's buzzing, it's buzzing, it's buzzing, it's buzzing. There's so much energy. And so it was always hard for me, right? I'm one of those people like the more, more chaotic, the more chaotic energy there is, the more like chaotic energy I get, right? And I have to work really hard to center myself. But the people who loved the emergency room, they were the kind of person who like, the more chaotic it got, the more crazy energy there was, the more they just were like, boom, like focused. Like they fed off that energy. That energy wasn't chaotic to them. That energy helped them go into this like really deep place of incredible concentration and focus. And like, we've got one thing to do and we're going to do it. And that 
was always fascinating to me, right? Because it's, it's, it's not something I have. I don't have that. I have to work really hard in the midst of that energy to stay focused. I have to, you know, use, you know, seriously, like think about like meditating actually. Mm -hmm. And so listening to you talk about it and talk about how in your childhood, you felt like you were groomed for this. You were, you were, you were groomed for this kind of, do you think about focusing like that in the midst of that chaotic energy? Or is this just sort of almost part of who you are? Oh, no, no, I, I, I still have to think about it. I mean, it may be a skill that I've practiced over time. And I can't speak for anyone, uh, all of us rather, but I, I know that most of us still have to center in the chaos and coordinate yeah. and work together at a team and pull together and and at, at points remind each other to center no matter what's happening. So, so while some of us may have more experience going back to whatever childhood or or life experiences we have, it's still a skill we we always practice, I would say. I, I don't know anyone for who who they don't have to do that. <laughs> So how do you keep doing it, right? Like what, because that takes a lot of energy, right? Like yeah. it takes a lot of energy to center yourself in the midst of that sort of chaotic energy. How do you do that in like your, your everyday life, right? You go in there day after day after day. How do you, how do, you do that? And that, that question of what do you do for self-care and what do you do for your personal health comes up a lot. And actually, I think that, the, I know we were talking about coronavirus earlier, but that is one of the issues that coronavirus has laid bare the effects of any kind of traumatic work on essential workers and all human beings. But it, now we're talking about the ER, so essential workers um, and the toll it can take on, on uh, a person's body, um, emotional, spiritual health is very real. So, some of the things that have personally helped me is any kind of physical practice. I mean, uh, yoga resonates for me, the physical practice of yoga. It's not for everyone, but any kind of positive physical exercise. Some people like swimming, some people like running, but some kind of physical practice. You had mentioned meditation. That helps me as well. Um, healthy eating. Therapy too. I mean, again, with, again with coronavirus, we're seeing rates of um, provider depression, anxiety, that can come from our personal lives, but then triggered by the environments we work in or highlighted by the fact that on top of whatever, whatever we're going through in our lives, on top of whatever undigested, unprocessed trauma we might have, now we add on top of that the trauma of our work. So let's not forget therapy and it shouldn't be stigmatized. That's a really important part of it as well. Yeah. Do you feel like it is stigmatized in? I think it still is. I mean, of course, like the emergency medicine world. Um, no, I think in general community, it's, it still is. And you know, that varies depending on the demographics of the community. I think it's becoming more accepted, but still segments of society where, where it's still uh, stigmatized. So I do want to bring awareness to the fact that it shouldn't be. Now it can be tough to find a good therapist and there are barriers like, is it covered by insurance? Who can afford it? And, but when one does have access to it and it might be a little trial and error in finding the right one for you, it can be really helpful and life-saving. Yeah. Um, I have a couple questions I wrote down. Let's see. So working in the emergency room and I feel like this it's a good segue. It's talking about how it changes you. Um, how has it, what's the best way in which being, being in the emergency room has changed you? The best. Right, because you were just talking about like the trauma, right? So, but what right. is the best? I mean, because our work changes all of us. What's the best? It's still good. I mean, I mean it when I say that even the difficult situations I find to be positive. I mean, one that comes to mind um, immediately is, uh, Actually, now there are a couple coming to mind, but I'll say this one Let's first. Tell us all of them. <laughs> one, one that comes to mind is just showing our our interconnectedness and giving us an opportunity to 
stand up for each other. Actually, both of these stories apply. But about a month ago, um, there was a young woman who came in, a young black woman, and she didn't know if she wanted to live anymore. There was too much stress. She was already pretty much on her own in life. So she was dealing with the stress of trying to, to live and make it with not family or friend support. And now it's the time of coronavirus where everything shut down and she's in isolation. So there's even less support available to her. And she works long hours as a clerk and the people coming in are abusive to her and she's being harassed at work and there's no one to turn to. And she can't just up and leave the job because she takes care of herself. And who's gonna keep the lights on and put food on the table if she does that. So she feels stuck in every way. And I just listen to her and we have a conversation about it. And, you know, after I make sure that she's, she's safe, um, I ask her if there's anything else we can do for her. If she feels like she needs to stay in the hospital, if she feels like just anything she might need. And she says, no, actually, like, I feel like I can go on and I never wanted to hurt myself. I just didn't know what to do. And there was no one to talk to. And I wanted to talk to someone. And she just wanted to feel that she was heard and that she wasn't going crazy, that what she was perceiving was accurate. And it was, and I told her it sucks and it's unfair and what she's going through is not right. But that each of us has been through that and I've been through that and somehow we have to find a way forward. And she said that that's all she wanted, just that conversation and she, wanted to leave now because she felt she could make it through the week and the month and that it was going to be okay. So that's one example where it's so simple and there were no heroic efforts and it was just me being there for someone who needed to feel heard and seen and just that was enough for her to go on. And that's one of those moments that in a, it's not small though, in this huge way, changes me because it, it is so critical. Um, yeah. How do you feel changed by it? How were you changed by it? Again, it was a demonstration of our interconnectedness and the fact that if we're willing to be present for each other, then progress can be made. I mean, this is a woman who felt despair and just that act of me being willing to hear her gave her enough so that she could go on. And yes, that was helpful for her, but it also gives me hope about the potential of human beings and what small acts can do for each other in that moment. So I don't know if that, if I conveyed that well enough to make sense, but for me, even though it was small, I've never forgotten it. I've remembered it every day. And I, I feel the potential in those acts. Has there ever been an experience where you weren't the doctor in that situation, right? Where you were, you were the person coming in needing something, right? Has there been any time in your life where someone has been the person for you? Okay, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking. Not too, is that a bad question? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a very good question. This is just a small example. Honestly, th this example comes to mind recently. <laughs> I don't know if my brother and sister-in-law are on here now. They probably are. They watch everything. But I will say that. And this is outside of the hospital, but it's yeah, the same. Yeah, anything, anything in your life, just so that people get the idea of how this works. Where I get so nervous. Hi, everyone. I get so nervous before each event and I, I, and I go into this zone and I listen to calming music on Pandora and have tea and just sit in quiet to relax and meditate before every event. 
uh, because I have, you know, I may have many skills, but public speaking and interviewing is new to me. This is a whole new world for me. So it was bet between interviews and uh, the recent one on the news, and I posted about this. My brother sent a text, just a, a supportive picture of him watching me on the news and saying how great it was. And that for me was so special, just knowing that, yes, I get so nervous, but even when I don't know it, there are people out there rooting for me. And that's magical. And I remember that before every interview and it, it, it helps. So, so that's an example of how I, I know how it can feel and just buttress you. So hence bringing back to that store clerk why I wanted to do that for her in the moment. And I've been the beneficiary of the same. Okay, so here's the flip side of that other question. <laughs> like that work changes us. Yeah. What's the way you dislike the most about how your work has changed you? It's easy to get jaded in this mm -hmm. um, profession, but it's not just emergency medicine. I mean, and we're seeing it in medicine in general, how it's often well, you know, the, the bureaucracy of medicine is taking over and healthcare in this country, it's run for profit like many industries. And so in that way, it's, it's, it's about profits. It's not about, you know, nine times out of 10, it's not about the wellness and welfare of the patients, the community, society, the people who work in the hospitals providing care. It's not, it's about profits. And there's evidence of that because if it really was about wellness, then for example, there'd be, this brings us back to coronavirus, there would be a coordinated federal response, for example, to coronavirus. And we would have the equipment we need. We would have the staffing, you know, healthcare providers wouldn't be furloughed, fired, um, Everyone would have sick leave if they needed it. I mean, it, it would just be, everyone would have access to care. It would truly be a right and not a privilege in this country. So working in that system, when you do care and you're really there just to provide care, when the system is working against you, it can harden you because to stay there, you do have to develop, you, you know, you develop some calluses so um, again, that is constant work to remind oneself why I'm there, but then also what can I do to make a difference? Because going along to get along is not the answer too. I mean, there needs to be action. The system is broken, the system doesn't work. So what action can we do? And that's why it was important for me to write these stories and amplify the voices of so many people who are traditionally silenced and highlight matters of structural racism and sexism so that we can act. When you talk about, you know, you want to highlight and give a voice to people. I was thinking about one of the stories in the book about the baby, mm -hmm. about the baby who came in, who had been abused and uh -huh. who didn't have a voice, right? Because this is a baby and how um, it was really one of the, to me, it was one of the hardest stories in the book. And I wonder if you can, for people who haven't read the book yet, right, right. maybe could you tell what that story is and talk about the ways in which we have a voice and the ways in which some people don't have a voice and mm -hmm. how we can be a voice for other people and, and how you do that both in the emergency room and through your book. Oh, right. Well, <laughs> Yeah, with that child, and she was almost two, just prevent, uh, presented as a, a febrile seizure. Um, and that's when kids, young kids, they may have a fever and then they get a, a seizure and it's usually, it's, it's not really a, a dangerous process typically. And a child may be brought in like that and maybe they're not so responsive, but you know, generally they do well and they get better. Um, and she was brought in with her, we find out her father, who was just so doting and seems totally appropriate with her. But in this case, 
she wasn't really waking up, which again can happen, just a little more complicated seizure presentation. Um, but something about her, I mean, despite the fact that she looked fine, like her skin was fine, her physical exam was normal, she wasn't waking up, so we, we were gonna get blood work and you know see if we could find a source of infection and x-rays and then transfer her out because our hospital didn't um, admit pediatrics where I was working at the time. So things were checking out. Her exam was fine. The x-ray didn't show pneumonia. Um, I ended up kind of getting a blood test I didn't need like for liver function. I didn't need it. But I, I clicked it accidentally. I felt I couldn't unclick it. I don't, there was just something, something ab about this that wasn't sitting right with me. And, and then we set up the transfer because she was going to go. So call the hospital, explain to the accepting doctor, complicated seizure. She'll be coming your way. Fine, fine. We're good with that. And then the radiologist calls me and says that there were broken ribs, ribs that were different stages of healing. So they happened at different points in time. And then I took the report. I look at, I had her lab work, which was just coming back and the liver tests were abnormal. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, I didn't have proof, but I suspected she was beaten and the liver function was abnormal because her liver, liver was bruised. Meanwhile, she was already on the stretcher out the door. So I called the accepting hospital and I told them, um, I told the same attending I spoke to that I was concerned about abuse and I told her why. And I did find out later that she was abused and there were charges filed and her brain was bruised and there was bleeding around her liver. And um, it was a terrible case. And it was one of those situations where I, I, she couldn't speak, you're right. And I didn't have to get the extra tests. And um, you know, ultimately I think it would all have been diagnosed, but, but in the moment there was just something about her, I don't know, her body or spirit that spoke to me, which made me feel there was something else going on. And so it allowed the workup to be expedited so that the next hospital could get on it even before she arrived. And I, I find that a lot that if we're silent and open, that we, we get the information from patients and situations. And that was one example. So it makes me think about how like working in hospice um, and I imagine it might be the similar, I don't want to, but um, there's like a sixth sense or something that you develop. And it's kind of hard to talk about, right? Because people who aren't in that work, you sound a little kooky, right? Yes. You sound, <laughs> sound kind of straight, you know, right? You sound, <laughs> um, and I, but it's a real thing, right? Like every, Every nurse and doctor I know who's been doing it for a long time will tell you that, I don't know, there's something, right? There's, there's something. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, do you have any other, anything to say about that? Or you, you don't want to sound too kooky about it? <laughs> no, <laughs> it does happen. Now, it does. You know, by, yeah. by this token, we have to be a little careful. We don't want to be misled by, I don't know, biases we have or, but, but there is how a do you walk that line, right? Like, how do you? Yeah, no, it's true. Sense. I mean, how, how do you make sense of that sixth sense? I guess. Right. That's the thing. I mean, we go with the sense, but then we still do the indicated evaluation because we could be wrong because we could be wrong. So, you know, like in that case, for example, if I was wrong and her liver function was fine and everything about it was fine. Okay. No harm, no foul. So I, I I think that as long as um, we do the appropriate workup, we are open to being incorrect. We're open in, to learning mm. more than we anticipated. And then I think it works out truthfully. I was also interested in that story because it, it sort of, I'm, I'm thinking about what you talked about when that patient came in and she was gonna kill herself. and she realized she just really needed to talk to someone, right? That she, and I was thinking about the ways in which so much of the work in the emergency room is about the body, right? Healing the body, but how, how so much of the healing also is simply about 
Um, being present to someone else's suffering, right? And that being present to someone's suffering has to, it has to go along with being present to what the body is telling you. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Were you gonna say oh, something? No, I was, and sorry to interrupt, but it's, it's true because there are many times when we, we can't fix anything physically. You know, there's an, another case, I hate calling them cases, but another um, situ uh, case, case comes to mind with a baby that was brought in, not breathing, newborn. And as the baby is being rolled in, we know, I mean, that, like you say, the sense, we already know the baby's gone. We know this newborn is gone. The parents were lovely. They, they tried, they worked really hard. It was very difficult for them to get pregnant. It was a perfect pregnancy. There was no problems the entire time. The checkup, their first checkup with their pediatrician, there was no problems. And now this infant who was dead was brought into the department. We did everything because it was a perfect baby did everything to try and bring this baby back. We knew what the outcome would be. There was nothing in that moment we could have done to change the outcome. And mainly we did everything because we knew how this was gonna affect the parents. And we wanted them to know that we tried. And so that was a moment where, I mean, it was devastating obviously to the parents um, they asked me to speak to the gynecologist who was the, um, the obstetrician for the pregnancy, but also a family friend. It was devastating for her, it was devastating for the whole team. And it was really a moment where all we could do is, is, is be there for each other and for the patient. All we could offer was presence. There was nothing else to offer. How do you... How did you learn to do that? I'm thinking about a time, again, when I worked at the hospital and I was, went to the emergency room and there was a case where a woman was 33, came in on the ambulance um, and she was, she was dead. She died of a massive heart attack and they called her parents in. And so I'm sitting in the room with the parents, right? And people don't know this, but all emergency rooms, hospitals all over, they have these secret little rooms you don't necessarily know about where you go and you sit with the chaplain and you wait for the doctor to come. And so we're sitting in the little room and the doctor came in and she went through, and she was young, and she was nervous. And the doctor, she went through everything they did. We tried A, B, and C and that failed. We then moved on to X, Y, and Z. When that failed, we moved on to, she went through the whole thing. And she said, and then finally we tried seven, eight, nine, and 10 and that failed. Right. <laughs> and so they were like, okay. And, and, right, and, and finally, finally the mom, it was the mom who says, so is she dead? And the doctor said, yes, yes, that's, that's what I just said. But she hadn't said it, right? Mm -hmm. She hadn't said it. Um, and it was just so hard all around because the parents, of course, are grieving. But then, you know, the next day I saw the doctor in the cafeteria and she came over and then she started crying, right? She yeah. was grieving. Cause she said, I messed that up. Like I did that, it was so bad. I did that so badly. And she said, you know, no one's ever taught me how to do that, right? No one, no one has taught me how to do that. No one has taught me how, they taught me all these things, every intervention you can do in the emergency room. And no one's taught me how to say I failed. And so it's a couple interesting things there. Number one, she saw it as she failed. Right, right. Number two, she felt like she hadn't been taught, right? That this is, this is a skill. This is a skill that needs to be taught. Um, so I just was wondering if you could, and that, that, that was all these like 20 years ago, right? But this has stayed right. with me. I, like I can close my eyes and I can, I can be in that situation again. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what can we do, right, for young emergency room or just any young doctors and nurses, right? Because so much of it, there is this sense for some of them that, I'll never forget what she said, you know, I failed. I failed to save the woman and I failed 
and telling her parents, like, I'm a failure, right? right? That was that experience for her. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Like, how how do you learn to do that? And what, what could you offer to younger doctors and nurses? Uh, well, she's right. Um, I mean, unless medical education has changed radically in the last, I don't know, four years since I was working in academic institutions. <laughs> then it's 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 not it's not really part of our education i mean we we are being encouraged now to not mint words and to be very clear and state clearly the person has died because you you can't understand it otherwise unless the words are used and then um also when it's possible again coronavirus but it, but it used to be possible to offer loved ones to come in and watch the code and that if they wanted to, they could, and that was helpful. I mean, again, that we're gonna have to readdress that later post pandemic. Um, and then it's pretty much up to each provider to figure out how they will manage themselves. That's just where things are. Maybe there are more progressive programs who teach this in you know, one humanities class, but uh, it's not emphasized in the training and it, it, again, it's slowly changing, but it's it's currently not. It's up to the individual. And I I am just being mindful in case there are questions. Oh, yes, want, there are. I don't, I don't want to eat into people's time, if there are. Yes, there are questions. Okay, yes. So Anonymous asks, <laughs> how would you characterize your relationship with your father today? Oh, what I care. Well, I mean, to be blunt, I mean, I hear from him periodically. So I suppose it's a little distant and tangential. And I speak about the importance of forgiveness, which condones nothing. It doesn't um, exonerate anyone either. I do believe in accountability, but it allows, for me, it allows me to move on with my life. I mean, I recognize that he, well, most people, I mean, short of, you know, psychopaths and sociopaths, but the vast majority of people who hurt other people, they're hurt. I mean, that's the, that's the saying, and it's true, hurt people hurt people. So I recognize it for what it is. Um, I forgive that. I, my philosophy with him is the philosophy I have for most people, I, I bless it and move on. So that's where it is. But my philosophy with him is also the same as my philosophy with most people that I, th I think people can be in your life, no matter what their title is. I don't think that certain title um, buys someone entry, like unlimited access to another human being's life. I don't condone that philosophy. I think that it's important to have healthy boundaries. I think it's important to not allow someone to be a toxic element in my life or like anyone's life, ideally. So I also believe that people can heal, they can change, they can grow, they can evolve if they would like to do so. So if someone is no longer toxic, sure, then maybe they are supposed to be on my path again. But I just, Give it, I'm not, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And I just give it to God in the universe. And that's how I move through life. Okay, another question. This is from Walter Finnegan. And this, he wanted to know, have you witnessed unfair triage prioritization based on race in the ER? This one would be really hard for me to know truthfully, um, just logistically because at least where I've worked, I'm not physically located at triage. Mm -hmm. um, nine times out of 10. Now, if there's some kind of ruckus going on, then of course I'll be alerted and I'll see it. But otherwise I, I'm not physically there. So that question I, I, I can't comment on. I don't know if there's a follow-up question or a question that would get to a different element, but, but I wouldn't really know that. Okay. Um, this is from um, Jay Kelly. Hi, Jay. It says, um, 
Are you prepared to step away from the medical industry? And if so, what is next? <laughs> I'm not prepared for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, I don't feel that my time, my time with patient care is over. I'm not, you know, even if millions of dollars fell from the sky, I'm not done with that part of my journey. So that's one. But number two, millions of dollars have not fallen from the sky. <laughs> so I cannot step away from my job that pays the bills. Yes, I'm passionate about it and I wanna be there, but also it's not a possibility. I mean, are there, are there other, yeah, I always say when the question comes up that I resonate more with the importance of being a healer than the title of doctor. And I think that healing work comes in many forms. So I happen to be a physician. I also happened to write a book and I enjoy writing. And I know that in the ER, I can help patient by patient or family by family. And with writing thousands or maybe millions at a time. So that's very important for me. So I, so what's next is what I'm doing. I'll continue the clinical and also continue to write and I'm new to this writing path, so I don't know exactly where it's taking me, but I will follow the path wherever it leads. Okay, so several people, to, to, to piggyback on that, several people have asked, um, when did you decide to write the book and why? Like, when did you know, okay, I'm gonna write a book and how did you make that decision? And, and people also wanna know, how did you find the time? Wow. I wanna know how you found the time, frankly. <laughs> so years ago, this took so, <laughs> So long, I don't know. I'd have to do the math exactly, but uh, maybe five years ago, I started writing it. And always, even when I was in residency, there were stories that stuck to me. And it was, it was important, one of my, or maybe two, of my main missions in doing this book was to demonstrate our interconnectedness as human beings and to explore how if, when we choose to heal ourselves, then we can be part of the support for another person in their journey of healing. And then in doing that, we can uplift society. And that is critical for me. That's the reason I wake up, the reason I breathe. And so that's why I decided to do the book. And I noticed along the way, there were different patients who stayed with me, their stories stayed with me and I wanted to reduce them to writing. I mean, they're not all there. Obviously it's one book, they're not all in the book, but I wanted to reduce it to writing to achieve that healing mission. So that's why I did it. And how I found the time, how I found the time was that everything else in my life kind of fell apart. <laughs> There's like nothing, there's nothing. I mean, I don't even have time. Like I, I pencil in when I can clean, like I desperate, like I fantasize about, having someone who can cook my meals and like my aunt, <laughs> hi aunt, my aunt Eileen will let you know, like that's my like fantasy. So yeah, so that's, yeah. So that's how it happened. I mean, it just, you know, it is what it is. I made it work. It's what you got to do. There are people in worse situations. I remind myself, you know, there's single moms out there working as like three jobs as a housekeeper, clerk and and child care. I mean, there are people who have to make it work in more challenging situations and with less. So sure, it's hard being a doctor and writing a book and launching a book and doing other writing. And then it's much harder for other people, so. Okay, this is a long question. This is from Lauren DePino. And she says- Oh, and, hi. I know, hi, hi, Lauren. <laughs> we, we both know her. <laughs> In the, Josh, in the Joshua chapter, you wrote this gorgeous line. I wanted to exhale, exhale all my anxiety over the uncertainty of life and breathe in Joshua's absolute faith in the universe, his absolute love for his body, regardless of its tumors, his absolute comfort in his own skin. I was in awe of Joshua's calm demeanor and acceptance of his mortality. It feels anomalous. How do we get to the point where we can be more embracing of what's usually considered to be a scary prognosis, considering all of us are likely to be there someday? How Joshua reacted seems unreal to me. Oh, 
So, so how do we get to that point? That's, a, that's agree. how do we find the meaning of life? <laughs> and it all comes what it is in the next uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> no, I agree with you. And I, I think that we touched on it um, a little while before when we talked about centering practices and, and, and self healing and self care practices. So I would re I would reiterate the same, honestly, like when it comes to, I don't know, physical activity therapy, it's the same answers because it's all the same work. I mean, part of the deal with being a human being is that there are gonna be challenges, there are gonna be situations that break us. And so it's how we deal with them. And don't worry, they will be many. So there will be many opportunities to gain and practice these skills. Whether we want them or not. Right, but, but <laughs> There right. are opportunities. I, I still believe there are opportunities. I love that. I actually really love that positive spin. Even when you were talking about growing up in an abusive household, it was the same idea. You were like, it prepared me, you know, as opposed yeah. to like, I had this really traumatic childhood. Instead, you were like, I was like ready to be an ER doc. I was, it's, it's, a be it's really beautiful. I, it's really, I think it's probably unusual. Well, and I'm saying that it's now, Michelle, you know, really I'm saying is. that now I wouldn't have said that it, 25 years ago, ah. right? You know, so it's part of the, the process to get to this point. And that's why it was critical for me to get to this point so that those people who can't say that because they're simply trying to survive. They're in it, right, they're right? in it. Then those of us who've come to the other side, at least of that part, because again, there's always gonna be something, but those who've, of us who've come to the other side can be there for the people who aren't at a point where they can say, I know I'm going to be okay and I know I can do this. So. Oh. Okay, another question. This is from Anonymous. She says, do you have any general advice for young women who grew up believing that equity was already established but found out otherwise when entering the workforce? I, I think the general advice is uh, There's something powerful and freeing about being honest about it. And I think that part of our socialization and part of what keeps inequity and structural oppression intact is the gaslighting that goes on, telling us it's not really happening, it's not there, don't worry, you can do it if you just try hard enough. But being honest about the fact that it is there, it is unfair, it is unequal. Well, first it's acknowledging that that part of it is not our fault. What we're seeing is real, it's not our fault. So now we can do what we can about it. And that starts with just moving forward. And that'll look different. I know this is just a general answer, but that will look different depending on your situation, a person's situation. I mean, there were times in my life where Dealing with it, for example, when I was an attending physician, going, going for a hospital administrative position, sometimes doctors do that in emergency rooms, they'll work clinically, but then also go for an administrative hospital position, more opportunity, it's kind of like a promotion and more experience. So I was going for the position and um, after whatever interview process they went through, my boss asked me to come into the office and I was glad I would finally get the decision. And he told me, although you were, you're super qualified, you totally can do this, you have amazing qualifications. And although you were the only applicant, they decided to leave it open. And I'm so sorry, Michelle, I hope you'll stay with us anyway. I hope you'll stay with us, but you know, women of color, well, women in general and people of color always leave because this hospital won't promote women or people of color. So in that situation, oh, of note, I found out I, I left because in that situation, my way of dealing with it was leaving. And I did find out after I left that they hired someone for the position who was a white male nurse. So yes, structural inequities. In that situation, what it looked like for me was leaving that hospital. In another position, what it may look like 
is fighting the system and potentially staying there. So what that action, and you know, that wasn't the only time there's, I had to tailor my response to, depending on the situation where I was. Yeah, so yeah. I would say, what's important to do is to keep moving forward. What's important to do to act. Now that action is gonna be tailored depending on the situation, but just know that it is possible. And unfortunately it's not fair. And we're going to have to fight to make structural change. This is me asking, yeah. where do you start, right? I mean, you look around sometimes and it's just like, right? Where do you start? You say you have to fight, right? Where right. do you start? You just, you start where you're at. <laughs> you, st you start where you're at and you keep going. I know we're having, it's, it, it's hard to say, you know, cause it's kind of general, but I mean, you know, even with the protests, okay, you know, so, in certain communities, they started with protests and then they got some change in certain police departments. I mean, it, that's where it depends on where you are, what action you can take, and then what the response is gonna be in your particular job or your particular neighborhood or with, you know, it, it's a little bit hard to say because we're so general, but I hope I'm getting the point across even vaguely a little bit, hopefully. No, I like that idea. Just start where you are when you see something. Start there. Because mm. you can't you can't take it on. You can't take on all of it, right? You can't do everything, right? But you gotta do something. You have to do something, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's another question. I like this one. This is from Connor. When you first began working in the ER, was there something you were required to do, either once or regularly, that you did not see coming when you imagined yourself as a healer? like unexpected, surprising things in the ER that you had to do? I'm, I mean, I'm going to be honest, not really. I mean, we do a lot of medical care, <laughs> social work. Um, we, we act as therapists. So I knew that that was all part of it. I mean, the, the, the only thing that is, and it's not really surprising, but the only thing that's um, discouraging is as time goes on, the increasing bureaucracy, the increased, and, and it depends on which hospital system, but just generally broadly speaking about medicine, um, the increase on billing and bureaucracy and, and getting increasingly removed from patient care now, again, I specifically, it became, and, and that's why it became increasingly urgent for me to be mindful about where I was working because I enjoy working in places where, yeah, we have that part, but they still care about doing right by patients. So I, I specifically look for that, which I'm happy about. I, I know there are places that are a lot worse than where I tend to go, but, um, but that's one thing that's been disappointing over time and su somewhat surprising. Um, here's the question. You knew it was coming. Here it is. <laughs> Where do you see the coronavirus going? What's, do you have any sixth sense, about, sixth sense about it? Maybe some hope, please. Oh, I mean, I mean eventually it'll, it'll get better. Eventually it will. I mean, I, I feel the same way that most of us in the, in the field feel. Um, you know, I'm in the Northeast, I practice in New Jersey now. So right now we have a relative lull in terms of the volume of cases and the severity of cases. We see what's happening in the South and creeping up the coast and just, just up in general. So we all anticipate it will be worse. I mean, it's, I've said round two, although it never really left, but just, we anticipate it will get worse. That's the anticipation. We don't know exactly when or how, but we're bracing, unfortunately. One day it'll get better. I mean, probably sometime next year, maybe a year from now, but we're gonna have to see. And that's gonna depend a lot on Unfortunately, again, there's not a coordinated federal response. Um, 
and it's doubtful there will be this year. So it'll come down to individuals doing what they can to, to stem this. Um, nobody wanted that answer, Michelle. Ah, Not what sorry. anybody wanted to hear, even if it is the truth. <laughs> I, know, I, I can't sugarcoat, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be sugarcoating it. I, I, yes, I agree, I, but, um, okay, this is, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, how do you, it's about your mom. Mm. How do you reconcile your mother's insistence you finish medical school before marrying with the abuse that you witnessed her tolerate during your childhood. Reconcile. Right, so she's this complex person, right? That she was right, like, right, right, really right. horribly abused and, and didn't right. leave dad right away. And yet with you, her daughter, she was like, no, right? You need to finish med school, you need to. I mean, it's funny. I mean, honestly, I, I feel like the more radical and progressive approach would be to say to one's daughter, doesn't matter if you get married or not. And if you're gonna get married, just know why. But anyway, that's a like a different conversation. So in so in that way it, it still fits. But I would say that the powers of denial are broad and deep and powerful. So there was always this compartmentalizing in my household and with my mother and her perspective on things. So I guess that that would be hard, I, I suppose, for readers who didn't deal with that or if you didn't grow up. I mean, it's so common in, a, in abusive households or even now we talk about, because of the political climate, we talk about narcissistic personalities. That's just one example. Um, there, there are many and they're, common in abusive households. And so people compartmentalize. So yes, there can be great dissonance between what people say and what they do. So I suppose that's how I understand it. Um, so, so much of your book, right, is about the beauty in breaking, right? The beauty mm -hmm. in brokenness, really. And I'm wondering, because you're so good at it, <laughs> what's the What's the benefit there, right? We talk about we talk about like compartmentalizing. We talk about denial is this bad thing. Although I, I had a I had a supervisor or maybe a teacher I can't remember once say to me, "Listen, it's easy to take away someone's denial. It actually is. Like as a chaplain, therapist, whatever, it's actually really easy to like tear that thing down. What do you have to replace it with, right? Deny, right? What do you have? And, and so I always, that always stuck with me. Is like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, that compartmentalization, right? Yeah. Like we're, we're so quick to be like, oh, compartmentalization, that's bad, right? right. But what purpose does it serve? Right. Is there and it serves, it serves until it doesn't. I mean, I mm. think of it as a crutch. Um, you know, I keep talking in stories, but, but okay, I'll skip a story this time. But I think of it as like literally a crutch. Like it's really good if you break your leg it's, it's really good to have a cast on. And that cast is critical for X amount of weeks until your body heals. And then it's gotta come off. The cast was not bad until you were better and you don't need it. And now it's bad because you could get an infection, your muscles atrophy. You become a weaker person for that cast that you needed at the time. So when it's time to come off, it was super, super good but when it's time to come off for you, for you now the stronger, more resilient you to go off into the world, it must come off. And I think of denial in the same way. Yes, it may help you to survive whatever acute trauma, but at some point, if you're gonna grow and progress in life, you have to face your life and make different decisions to move forward. So I think that's what we, can replace it with, it, but it's not we, because it's the decision of an individual. That's what that individual can replace it with, should they choose to. And I think it's actually really difficult to remove denial. I think it's super, it's way easier to remove a cast <laughs> than denial. And if you don't believe that, you need to come to the ER with me. <laughs> 
maybe to some family gatherings, actually. And I think many people can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> many people in families and in ERs. <laughs> Well, we don't actually have, I don't think we have any time left, but I do just want to say this, that this is, you have a lot of fans. Christina thinks you should be Surgeon General. Oh, thank you. I agree. I think, <laughs> um, and I don't, I, I don't know if Tom needs to come on and cut us off. Feel free to do that. Oh, I don't want to cut you off, but yeah, we, oh. we have to. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, the both of you, uh, Michelle and Carrie. This was really uh, inspiring and moving. Um, I just want to remind everyone again to please purchase the book. It, there's a link in the chat that takes you to politicsandprose.com. Backwards, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all next time on PNP Live. Thank, Thank you. you so much for both of you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Bye, Michelle.